If you start in, um, in Manhattan uh, and you go north from Manhattan, the first thing you hit is the Bronx. Uh, if you keep going north through the Bronx, the next thing you hit is Westchester County, New York, with uh, great towns you'll hit first on the road like Yonkers and New Rochelle. Uh, but if you keep going, going north, going deeper into sprawling Westchester County, New York, you will eventually get to a place called Bedford. Um, and Bedford, New York is pretty. I have been there. It's a nice part of the state of New York. It's a nice part of the country. Uh, Bedford also has some interesting uh, historic sites. It's got a place called Stepping Stones, this home. This is the preserved home of Bill W., uh, if you're an AA, or if you know anybody who's ever been in AA, you know what Bill W. means, including the fact that it's just the last initial. Bill Wilson was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and his home is preserved in Bedford, New York. It is a national historic site. Uh, not far from there is the massive Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. Uh, which is actually why I have been to Bedford, New York. I used to work on prison reform issues in a previous life, so I have been to that prison. Uh, it's the only maximum security women's prison in the New York State correctional system. Uh, Bedford, New York was also briefly the focus of national and even international attention in 2009 when then Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi made plans to travel to the annual meeting of the UN General Assembly. He sent a large advance party to pitch him a tent on the grounds of an estate in Bedford, New York. Uh, literally, they were going to pitch a tent on the lawn of that estate, and Gaddafi and his entourage planned to stay in that tent while he was in New York visiting the UN General Assembly. That was the plan until town officials in Bedford decided they were not into that idea at all. They sent somebody from the town over to inspect like the, the, the extension cords and the other little temporary electrical connections they had set up to service Gaddafi's would-be living quarters in that tent on the lawn. And the town, upon inspecting those electrical facilities, issued a stop work order. So even though the Libyan government rented that place for him, the Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi never actually ended up staying in that tent on that lawn at that estate in Bedford, New York. But the specific location of that weird three-day sort of small-scale diplomatic crisis over Muammar Gaddafi and his extension cords, the specific location of that in Bedford, New York, was a place called Seven Springs. That was, that was the estate where, where Gaddafi planned to stay on the lawn. At the time of that Gaddafi controversy, Seven Springs was owned, and it is still owned today, by President Donald J. Trump. And that tonight is where we get to the crime part of this story, <laughs> the, the maybe crime part, um, or at least the crime question. This property in Bedford, New York, Seven Springs, uh, as you can see, it's a big mansion. Um, it's just over 200 acres. Mr. Trump bought the property in 1995. When Trump bought it in 1995, he paid $7.5 million for it. And there's good evidence, reliable public records evidence, that that property, that, Silver, or that Seven Springs property, um, has appreciated nicely over time. The Washington Post reports that by 2013, so less than 20 years after Trump first bought it in 1995, that property had more than doubled in value. Uh, it was assessed in 2013 at $18.9 million. Nice, right? Uh, the local paper, the Westchester County Journal News, says by 2017, the, process, the, uh, the property was assessed even a little bit higher. It was assessed at $19.6 million. President Trump, in his federal financial disclosure form for last year, 2018, he didn't have to give a precise valuation for the property. On those kinds of federal ethics forms, you just have to give a range of value. Uh, when President Trump filed his financial disclosure form last year, he said the value of that property in Westchester County was in the range of 25 to 50 million dollars. Now, even 25 million dollars is considerably more than what we know that property was assessed at in terms of its value just one year before, but eh. What are you going to do? What, what is value really, right? These things can always be fudged a, a little bit. It's basically the same thing, ballpark figure getting assessed at $19, $20 million within the last few years. He says he puts it at a range of $25 to $50 million. Well, at least the range starts at 25 
million. But just, just put it, let, let's, can we put that value up over time? Can we do, yes, we've done this on this little graph. Um, now remember, this, this is all for this one same property. As far as we know, there have been no massive changes to this property over the time that Trump has owned it. I mean, Gaddafi did send his dudes to go put up a tent there for him, but then they had to take the tent down and go home. So as far as we know, nothing really has changed. But you can see the progression there of the value, right? This is, this is a happy real estate valuation story. You buy it for $7.5 million in 1995. By 2013, it's up to $19 million. By 2017, it's up to $20 million. By 2018, you are somewhat plausibly saying it's worth... 25 to 50 million dollars. All right, so that's, that's the public record. That's where we thought we were on this. If you were at all interested in that particular Donald Trump property, this is what you would find in terms of the value of that property. But now we, as a country, have got something quite new about that property, and it turns that sort of boring, you know, vaguely happy real estate valuation story into a suspenseful cops and robbers crime drama that potentially becomes a major chapter in American presidential history and in the constitutional confrontation between great power and American independent law enforcement. Because in his riveting day-long testimony before the House Oversight Committee yesterday, one of the things the president's longtime personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, made public was a short stack of financial information. These are documents that were apparently among the materials that were seized from Michael Cohen's home and office when the FBI raided him last year to serve multiple search warrants on him. Uh, these documents were seized by the FBI. They have since been returned to Mr. Cohen by the government. Um, he says in preparation for his testimony, he went through those boxes of returned material and he was thus able to hand over, among other things, these financial statements as part of his testimony yesterday. He then, yesterday at his testimony, explained what these statements were and what they were used for, and he did it in pretty blunt terms. I am giving to the committee today three years of Mr. Trump's personal financial statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013, which he gave to Deutsche Bank to inquire about a loan to buy the Buffalo Bills and to Forbes. These are exhibits 1A, 1B, and 1C to my testimony. It was my experience that Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes. I'd like to talk to you about the president's assets. Since by law, these must be reported accurately on his federal financial disclosure, and when he submits them, uh, for a bank loan. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you served for nearly a decade as then businessman Trump's personal attorney and so-called fixer. Uh, did, you have, did you also have an understanding of the president's assets and how he valued those items? Yes. To your knowledge, did the president or his company ever inflate assets or revenues? Yes. And uh, was that done with the president's knowledge or direction? Everything was done with the knowledge and at the direction of Mr. Trump. You have provided the com this committee with copies of the president's financial statements or parts of them from 2011, 2012, and 13. Can you explain why you had these financial statements and what you used them for? So these financial statements were used by me uh, for two purposes. One was discussing with media, whether it was Forbes or other magazines, um, to demonstrate Mr. Trump's significant net worth. That was one function. Another was when we were dealing later on with insurance companies, we would provide them with these copies um, so that they would understand that the premium, which is based sometimes upon uh, the individual's capabilities to pay, um, would be reduced. And all of this was done at the president's direction and with his knowledge? Yes, because whatever the numbers would come back to be, we would immediately report it back. 
And did this information provided to us inflate the president's assets? I believe these numbers are inflated. And of course, inviting, inflating assets to win a newspaper poll to boost your ego is not a crime. But to your knowledge, did the president ever provide inflated assets to a bank in order to help him ob obtain a loan? But you may answer that question. These documents and others were provided to Deutsche Bank uh, on one occasion where I was with them in our attempt to obtain money so that we can put a bid on the Buffalo Bills. Thank you for your answer. To your knowledge, did the president ever provide inflated assets to an insurance company? Yes. Who else knows that the president did this? Alan Weisselberg, Ron Lieberman, and Matthew Calamari. Today, in the wake of this testimony, uh, the Daily Beast was first to report that Trump Chief Financial Officer Alan Weisselberg uh, will also now be summoned to testify to Congress. Uh, the Daily Beast was first to report that he will be called to testify before the House Intelligence Committee. House Oversight Chairman Elijah Cummings told reporters today that if you are looking for a guide as to who else may be summoned to testify in the wake of Cohen's testimony, a pretty good predictive guide to anticipating those witnesses would just be to uh, read through the transcript and highlight every name that was mentioned as someone who could potentially provide useful information. Uh, one of the potentially provocative developments that that may signal is that one or more of the president's adult children may be included in that list. We shall see. Um, but before, even before anybody else is called in for questioning in the wake of Cohen's testimony, Cohen has already handed over exhibits and documents, including those checks from President Trump himself and from the trust that controls the president's businesses, those checks reimbursing Cohen for payments he made ahead of the election and for which he's now about to go to prison because they were illegal campaign contributions made as part of a felony campaign finance scheme. But there's also those 2011, 2012, 2013 financial statements, which Cohen told Congress had been used for multiple purposes. He said those statements were used to try to convince a magazine uh, to call President Trump a billionaire, try to convince a magazine to give the president a higher net worth than he actually had. And, you know, I mean, what do you do, what do, you do with that? You know, you know, pitiful, vain, and sad are some of the lesser dwarves in this story. <laughs> but, you know, lying to a magazine to make yourself look richer than you are is nobody's idea of a crime. The serious issue here is that Cohen testified that these financial documents were also submitted to insurance companies to try to get Trump's premiums reduced on his insurance policies. And significantly, he said these financials were submitted to a bank specifically to Deutsche Bank, to try to get himself a cash loan, what may have been as large as a billion-dollar cash loan, to try to buy a professional football team. And now here is why this is a conundrum for us as a country. Because go back to Trump's big house in Westchester County, New York, right up by the maximum security women's prison. Put up that graph again showing the, the value of that house. Again, these figures are all based on public documents. The purchase price when Trump bought it, public assessments of the property over time, Trump's own legal declaration in his ethics filing last year about the value of that property. Remember, he gave that range 25 to 50. And again, over time, you can see that property appreciating in value, starting at $7.5 million in the mid-90s, up to 19 and $20 million in 2013, 2017, by last year up to this range of 25 to 50 million. Okay, well, what Michael Cohen gave Congress yesterday was a set of financial statements from President Trump and the Trump Organization, including one statement from 2012, which Michael Cohen said was used to apply to a bank to try to get a large cash loan. On that 2012 financial declaration, that same property in Westchester County, which has been valued over time at seven and a half million dollars, put that graph back up there, seven and a half million dollars, 19 million dollars, 20 million dollars, maybe that range of 25 to 50. In his 2012 financial statement, which he used to try to get a big cash loan from a bank, President Trump valued that same property at 291 million dollars. <laughs> really? That's hilarious. I mean, what could possibly explain that, that what they thought they had discovered an amazing diamond mine there in 2012, but then by 2013 they realized actually somebody had just spilled a cooler full of ice cubes and those weren't diamonds after all? 
I mean, how do you go from $291 million one year, and then the next year your property drops in value by $272 million, back to what it used to be? I mean, even if you just want to compare apples to apples, right, with President Trump's own assessment of the value of this property, it literally went in 2012 from $291 million to last year, 25 to 50. I mean, and that's just his own assessment of the value of that property. And that's ridiculous. He's going from $300 million to maybe $50 million when nothing changed at the property. And if that was just about making himself appear super rich for Forbes magazine, that would be, you know, vain and small and lying and sad. But that is not what Michael Cohen testified as to what these financials were used for. Mr. Trump's personal financial statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013, which he gave to Deutsche Bank to inquire about a loan when we were dealing later on with insurance companies, we would provide them with these copies. These documents and others were provided to Deutsche Bank uh, on one occasion where I was with them in our attempt to obtain money. Now, I am not a lawyer. Uh, statistically speaking, neither are you, <laughs> I'm guessing. Uh, but even just as people who are occasionally watching the news during the Donald Trump presidency, we all can recognize that what's being described here is potentially a felony, right? I mean, for one thing, we've seen the president's campaign chairman convicted of this as a felony. <laughs> Remember the financial institution scheme in the Paul Manafort indictment? You know, when he was still being charged with Manafort and Gates, remember that? Manafort, Gates, and others executed and attempted to execute a scheme and artifice to defraud and to obtain money and property by means of false and fraudulent pretenses, representations, and promises from banks and other financial institutions. As part of the scheme, they repeatedly provided and caused to be provided false information to banks and other lenders. They defrauded the lenders in various ways, including by lying about Manafort and his company's income, lying about their debt. They provided doctored financial documents at a time when Manafort's financial statement should have shown less than $400,000 in net income. They instead told the bank he had four and a half million dollars in net income, lying about that so that he could get a loan. And lying to the bank so that he could get a loan. Lying to the bank about his real financial situation so he could get a loan, that's part of the reason Paul Manafort is going to jail. It's also part of the reason Michael Cohen is about to go to jail, right? Remember the criminal information outlining Michael Cohen's crimes? Michael Cohen, the defendant, willfully and knowingly made false statements for the purpose of influencing the action of a financial institution in connection with an application for a home equity line of credit, which is a loan. Quote, Cohen made false statements to Bank 3 about his true financial condition. Remember the, the, the hearing, the day that Cohen is there giving his allocution in court. The judge interrupts Michael Cohen while he's pleading guilty and explaining all his crimes. Judge makes sure he understands that he's pleading guilty to bank fraud and why. The judge says, quote, well, you knew it was false, that it falsely depicted your financial condition, did you not? The defendant, Michael Cohen, yes, your honor. The judge, and you omitted those statements, did you not, for the purpose of influencing action by a financial institution? The defendant, Michael Cohen, yes, your honor. Yes, I understand that this is felony bank fraud, to lie to a bank for the purpose of getting a loan, to lie to them about my real financial situation. I mean, even if all you have been doing for the last couple of years is just occasionally watching the news about this administration, which means you've occasionally been watching people connected to the president go to prison for felonies. I mean, one of the things we've all become intimately aware of is the types of financial crimes for which people go to prison sort of on the regular. And now what we have as a country is now we've got this testimony under oath of the president's longtime personal lawyer. We've got his testimony and we've got some documentary evidence to back it up, which would seem to indicate that the president potentially has done the same kind of bank fraud that his campaign chair and his lawyer are already going to prison for. I mean, what Cohen testified to and what these documents showed appears to be the wild overinflation of the value of an asset, right? His $7 million house is somehow now a $291 million house, according to a financial document he submitted to a bank for the purpose of trying to get a loan from that bank. 
According to Michael Cohen, this same information has been submitted to at least one insurance company as well for the purpose of reducing his insurance premiums. Lying to a financial institution for the purpose of influencing that institution's behavior can be felony financial fraud. The Washington Post today put this set of facts to a former uh, a commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Joseph Grunfest, who's now a law professor at Stanford. Uh, he told them, quote, Michael Cohen's testimony opens another line of inquiry into bank fraud. And, you know, the devil's in the details and context is everything. Uh, the Post reports that at, in one copy of this same 2012 financial statement that they obtained independently, Trump's accountants appended a long disclaimer to the financial statement. So maybe that's important. Disclaimer or not, if this was potentially going to inv be investigated as possibly felony bank fraud, you'd need to see what the bank actually received from Trump, how these materials were presented by Trump and his business and for what purpose. As the former SEC commissioner put it to the Post today, quote, to determine whether fraud occurred requires a careful look at the text of the statutes, but also at the documents that were submitted to the bank. The question is whether there was a knowing attempt to defraud the bank. Well, the bank in question here, according to Michael Cohen, is Deutsche Bank. Did President Trump try to get a loan out of Deutsche Bank by randomly adding more than a quarter billion dollars to the value of his house up by the prison? <laughs> Pretending it was on like hills made of gold or sitting on a secret diamond mine that one year. I mean, publicly, uh, we don't know. There were reports December 2017 that federal prosecutors from the special counsel's office had subpoenaed Deutsche Bank for documents detailing that bank's relationship with President Trump. That reported subpoena of that bank was uh, apparently occasioned one of the great reported presidential freakouts concerning the special counsel's office, including what was reported by the New York Times to be the first concerted effort by President Trump to fire special counsel Robert Mueller, specifically in response to those reports that Mueller's office had subpoenaed Deutsche Bank. Now, that reporting about Mueller subpoenaing Deutsche Bank was later walked back. It's still not clear whether or not the special counsel's office ever did subpoena Deutsche Bank for their Trump-related records. We know that Democrats in Congress tried to elicit information from that bank uh, about their relationship with Trump over the past couple of years. Republicans at the time were in control of both houses of Congress. They were not interested in pursuing those lines of inquiry themselves, and Deutsche Bank therefore didn't have to respond to any of those requests. Now, though... The Democrats control the House, and today the chair of the Financial Services Committee in the House, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, told Politico.com that Deutsche Bank is now cooperating for the first time. She said, quote, they are just now being cooperative. They had not been. But she says now they are being cooperative and they are handing over documents at the request of her committee. So here's my question. I mean, this thing involving this property in Westchester County, the testimony by Cohen about financial and the financial statements concerning that property and what he says those financial statements were used for. This inexplicable 200 plus million dollars that pops up on that financial statement. That financial statement that he says was used to try to get a loan and to try to affect Trump's insurance rates. I mean, this is basically just one little case study of the potential criminal exposure we are now cottoning to when it comes to this president. I mean, there's lots of things that we could have chosen and told you a story like this about the president, right? Let's just pick this one about the valuation of this property for the purposes of illustrating the question and the conundrum we are now in as Americans. Because, right, these financial statements have now been handed over by Cohen to Congress. They're now in the hands of Congress. We believe these financial statements have already been through the hands of the FBI, and therefore they have been seen by federal prosecutors. We've also now got Cohen's blunt, under oath assertions as to what those financial documents were used for. If Deutsche Bank is now handing over documents to the Democratic-controlled congressional committees, then presumably we will soon know if Michael Cohen was right in his testimony yesterday, and if these documents were in fact used in a loan application to Deutsche Bank, or if they were used with insurance companies, or if they were used with any other financial institutions. I mean, clearly there appears to be something wrong with that 2012 financial statement. Clearly that is not a $291 million property, as nice as it may seem. I say that it's not a $291 million property, not because I can tell at a glance what a property is worth. I say that because that's what Donald Trump says. Trump doesn't even claim it's a $291 million property. Not when he knows people are watching. When he filed his financial disclosure form as a public official in 2018, he said it was worth 25 to 50. 
Well, then how was it worth 291 million in 2012? I mean, if that quarter billion dollar magic trick he tried to play with that financial statement is in fact evidence of felony bank fraud, as far as I can tell, we're well within the 10 year statute of limitations for such a crime. As a country, now, we have all just been shown evidence of this potential felony bank fraud by the president. And we know Congress has it, and we believe federal prosecutors have it. But here's the question. Who does what with that information? I mean, as a country, it's not cool to just, like, know about the felony, <laughs> right? I mean, in the wake of Michael Cohen's testimony yesterday, there's a whole bunch of different potential avenues for evidence that may lead to overt criminal exposure for the president. This financial fraud thing is just one of them. I mean, to the extent that the president's potential criminal exposure is about Russian interference in the election, potential conspiracy or cooperation with that interference, the relevant prosecutors, at least for now, would seem to be the prosecutors at the special counsel's office. To the extent that the president's criminal exposure may be about the campaign finance felonies, for which Michael Cohen is already going to prison. Well, those felonies have thus far been prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. If the president is also criminally exposed for other garden variety financial fraud, say the kind of bank fraud that Manafort and Cohen were both convicted of already this past year, that too could easily be at the center of the bullseye for prosecutors in SDNY. That's the kind of bread and butter, white collar financial crime that SDNY prosecutors bring to court every darn day. I mean, everything from high-profile cases like WorldCom, that famous case where that company radically overvalued itself, right, to, to everyday crooks like Michael Cohen trying to get his home equity line of credit and misstating his financial status to the bank in order to do it. That's, that's what they do. Those cases come up every day. Big cases, small cases, cases people care about, cases people don't. We spoke to the former deputy chief of that U.S. attorney's office, June Kim today from SDNY, he told us that, in fact, this is the day-in, day-out, run-of-the-mill prosecutorial work of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. He told us today, quote, people who inflate their financials, for example, to obtain a mortgage, and who deflate their financials, for example, to pay less taxes, those people are engaging in very common schemes and have been prosecuted regularly. If Trump Organization documents and Deutsche Bank documents and whatever other evidence we're about to have publicly aired. If that evidence paints a compelling, at least public picture, that the president appears to have engaged in pretty clear instances of financial crimes, financial felonies, financial fraud schemes of the kind that are routinely prosecuted against all sorts of people and companies and entities in this country. Well, who prosecutes it when it comes to him? Who prosecutes, what, prosecutes it when it comes to him? Would it be an act of bravery or an act of sort of political high wire walking in order to prosecute it when it comes to him? If somebody is going to try to prosecute him for, for this stuff, when and where and how? Because even with just what we've seen publicly, it sort of feels like we are there. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.